All right, hello, and welcome to Cloud Native Live, where we dive into the code behind Cloud Native. I'm Itai Shakuri, I'm Director of Open Source at Apple Security. I'm also a Cloud Native Ambassador and will be your host for today. Um, so every week we bring a new set of presenters to showcase how to work with Cloud Native technologies. They will uh, build things and break things and answer your questions. Um, join us every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, this week we have Billy Click with, with us today to talk about uh, improving Kubernetes experience. Sounds uh, very intriguing. Uh, before we jump into that, uh, I would like to draw your attention to uh, KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, North America, that uh, is open for registration, um, in-person conference and also virtual. So very exciting. Um, you should see the link uh, popping up right now if you want to take a look and register. We really hope to see you there. Um, and also, just a quick uh, reminder that this is an official live stream of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please don't add anything to the chat uh, or questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. So basically just uh, please be respectful of your uh, fellow participants and presenters. So, uh, Billy, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Billy Cleek. I'm a staff engineer at, at DigitalOcean. In the past group, we, we build things like Kubernetes, our DOKS, Marketplace, App Platform. Um, uh, I'm sure there's some things that I'm forgetting. Uh, and uh, DBAS is, is another one that, that we've been working on a lot lately. And I've been writing Go code, pri primarily Go codes, for since about the end of 2013, shortly before Go 1.2 came out. We'll be talking a lot about a lot of Go today. Um, I'm also the uh, uh, the package main. I'm, I'm also the maintainer for for Vimgo. So if you write Go and you're using Vimgo, um, you're you probably you're using something that I work on. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, great. So actually, uh, quite a intriguing title. How can you offer to improve our Kubernetes experience? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, so when I started DigitalOcean in 2017, they had started creating a, uh, a platform on top of Kubernetes. So you know, it's been said that Kubernetes is a platform upon which to build platforms, and that's exactly what, what DigitalOcean had done. Um, the platform is called DOCC, and it provides a, 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 a an opinionated platform, really simplifies the Kubernetes experience so that um, all the Kubernetes users don't have to understand all the particulars of all the YAML and, and groups, versions, and kinds. They don't have to worry about updates or upgrades or anything like that. That's all taken care of for them. Um, and of course, it's opinionated, so it'll, it's going to do things like it's going to inject environment variables into people's applications so they have information on what region they're in or what, what particular cluster they're in. We, we run about 14 um, large clusters. These clusters are somewhere between like 15 and, and 40 nodes, typically. Um, and they all the nodes have between 24 and 48 CPUs. So these are large um, shared environments. Um, and, and so we want to kind of, we want to protect uh, those large shared environments from, you know, people that might might be doing something that would be dangerous to others, right? You have to worry about noisy neighbors and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of protections built into DOCC. Um, but DOCC oftentimes does not have um, you know, it, it satisfies the 80% case. People sometimes need to get outside of that box and go to more of a, a, a kube cuddle experience where they're using Kubernetes manifest directly. But even in those cases, they want to, they, they've they come to expect certain things to be available in DOCC. And the, the team that maintains DOCC needs to be able to change how things work, change a lot of the implementation details. And so what we found is um, using things like mutating emission webhooks and validating emission webhooks um, allows the DOCC C team to make sure that like, regardless of how you're creating your applications, whether you're using the DOC manifest, which is JSON and can take like, I've seen it take like 280 lines of YAML down to about 70 lines of, of JSON. Um, it'll, so regardless of whether, whether you're using that or whether you're using Kubernetes manifest, you still want to have those environment variables injected. You still want to have your syslog sockets and things hooked up and mutating emission webhooks is how we do that without having to make sure that everybody in the company understands all how how the nodes are configured uh, and make sure that they don't have to worry about um, hooking things up like all those environment variables. All right, so, so uh, to clarify this for the audience, is the topic of the call uh, DOCC and how it can help them or how you, the DOCC team, used admission 
controllers and webhooks to uh, improve your experience. Yeah, so it, it's it's about how we, how we use admission webhooks. Um, right. So what we you know the mission webhooks are really the fundamental building block to creating a, a platform on top of on top of Kubernetes. Um, right. you, you can also combine that with custom resources, but we're not going to get into custom resources today. We're going to focus just on providing a curated experience. So, you, so if you're maintaining or managing a, a, a cluster for some folks and you want to make sure that they have certain features available, whether that's mounting volumes automatically or injecting environment variables into the applications, that you that you can you, you know how to do that and start building that platform. Got it. So maybe let's start by introducing the, the concept of uh, admission webhooks uh, and controllers and uh, see how it goes from there. Yeah, sounds good. So um, I'm, going, I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, and I, I believe I'm going to share my, I'll just share uh, a bash my terminal window for right now. Um, I, I've stood up a, a DOKS cluster in DigitalOcean and also created a um, uh, DigitalOcean registry and hook that up to the cluster already. So it's real quick. Let's kind of go through. Can you see my screen okay? Not yet. I'm sure in a second. Make sure I selected the right one. Check. See the terminal window? Um, I do not. Oh, okay. right. Now we got it. Okay, great. So we have we have here that has a, uh, a small cluster that has three nodes. Um, this is running in DOKS. Um, I'm going to just show real quick that we have a, uh, a, de a deployment. And we just call, I just call this one example. And you can see that, that, that this deployment ha is really simple. It has a single container. All, all that container does is, is prints out the, the date and the host name every 15 seconds. We put a, um, a CPU limit in place and a CPU, some CPU requests in place. And the reason we put those limits in place is we're, what we're going to do today is walk through how to build a mutating emission webhook that will react to that CPU limit and inject some environment variables based on that. All right. Okay, so, so right now, um, there are no pods in um, in the default namespace because I've because I've scaled um, the, uh, the the application down. I'm going to scale it up so we get one pod. And you remember that when we looked at that deployment, there were no environment variables there. So now if we go look at um, there's one one pod that we've that we've created. We see that there's a go max go max prox uh, yeah. environment variable has been injected. And the reason we did that is we is is the and, and digital is primarily a go shop. So all the things we're going to talk about today, uh, we're going to focus just on this one environment variable because it's simple and, and can provide um, the path forward. Um, but it's it's not it's not overly complicated. But you can you can do very complicated things with with mutating emission webhooks to to provide that platform that you want. Um, in this case, we chose Go Max Prox because Go by, by its very nature is, is, is highly concurrent and, and built for concurrency and parallelism. Um, when we have uh, users running their applications on these nodes that have 48 processors, Go automatically wants to spin up 48 threads to manage all the Go routines. Um, but when you have a CPU limit of one, that means you're going to have 48 threads, but you only have one CPU. So you can't really take advantage of all the things you'd want to take, take advantage of for parallelism. So you want to, in, in, instead of thrashing uh, between all those threads, we want to uh, make sure that the level of parallelism is the same as or reasonable um, according to what the, uh, the user set the CPU limit to. And so that happened through a mutating emission web hub. So, um, to, to set this up, um, there's there's a couple of things that things that we need to do. Um, first thing is you have to create a uh, a, uh, a mutating webhook configuration. Um, so let's go take a look and see what that looks like. So, a mutating webhook configuration uh, is, is very 
it is, it's pretty straightforward. It really consists of, of a webhooks property um, that contains an array of admission review versions. And that admission review version uh, contains a client config, which has a CA bundle. So this is going to be the certificate that, uh, that the Kubernetes control plane will trust. So um, that all the, um, all, all the Kubernetes webhooks have to have uh, have, have to be secured with, with SSL or TLS, so um, it's HTTPS only. And so, in order for the control plane to be able to trust the uh, what what it's what it's talking to, you put the CA bundle in the mutating in the mutating webhook configuration. Um, you also provide the URL for this particular webhook, a failure policy which can be either failed or ignore, uh, a match a match policy, a name for the uh, Sorry about that. Uh, and a name for the particular um, review version, which in this case is going to be, uh, we'll go up to this. Yeah, object, we're going to do object ignorable go max prox. Um, then a selector, which says what things, what resources this should apply to um, and, and within the cluster. And then, of course, the kinds of resources and the operations uh, on those resources that this should apply to. Um, and then, so, this, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, maybe we can uh, describe uh, in a second the high level flow of things uh, uh, so that people can visualize it in their mind. So, any, uh, someone creates a resource, let's say a pod, yep. Kubernetes API uh, server uh, handles this request. And because we register this um, um, webhook, then we tell basically Kubernetes whenever something like this happens that matches this criteria, please call out to my um, webhook handler, my, my, my web server that I stood up in advance, right? And this is where, for example, the, uh, the CA bundle comes in because how would Kubernetes know that they, uh, it can trust that server? And this is the criteria and so on, right? Just wanted to uh, summarize the high level flow for uh, the viewers. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. That, so the, the con you, what the mutating webhook configuration is doing is, is um, providing a configuration so that the con so the Kubernetes control plane, Kube controller, can knows knows what to call, knows when to call it, and knows what whether or not it can be trusted. Um, a, a a webhook can be either a validating um, webhook or a mutating webhook. Validating webhooks can be used to make sure that someone has the right permissions to modify a certain field or that they, they don't use certain fields. So like in earlier, I talked about DOCC. DOCC, for instance, because it's a large multi-tenant environment, makes sure that um, people can't use host network. Um, it, it does things like make sure that people can't spin up privileged pods, right? Because, because we don't want all those users getting access to um, the underlying nodes. Um, we also put restrictions on what volumes they can mount if someone is using uh, Kubernetes directly, but um, so yeah, the, this this is all just uh, explaining to, to the control plane exactly how to connect, when to when, when to use the webhook, and, and what things it should apply to. Great. Um, uh, by the way, could you make the font a little bit uh, bigger, please? Bigger, absolutely. Thanks. How's that? That's good. Thanks. Okay. All right. So. So that, that's that's the mutating mutating webhook. Um, in this case, we are we are running the uh, the the webhook in the cluster itself, um, and because because we're running it in the cluster, we also want to make sure that um, if the webhook is down for some reason, um, or if uh, or, or you know certain critical things that might need to be executed executed in the cluster, like like your your CNI, if you're running that in your in your cluster, that it's that the, the, the lack of the uh, instance, if the instance is down, like if you're spinning up a new cluster or if you're doing an update or something while someone else is, is trying to um, make changes to CNI, that we, we don't get into a, a circular dependency problem. So we make these uh, these match policies a little bit more complicated than what they would need to be. Um, in this case, the, the base admission policy is this last one here, um, which is just go max prox CNL webhook configuration. Um, then we had we had two others. Um, they're really function as escape hatches. Uh, the first one is is NS ignorable, go max prox um, with that name. And what it does is make sure like hey if if a label 
uh, CNL webhook, allow webhook failure, and this is customizable, exists on the namespace, and it doesn't exist on the object, uh, then we're going to use a policy of ignore so that if the webhook fails, it's okay. It, the, 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 uh, the pod can still be created. And then we do something similar with the, with the object ignorable where we say, hey, if, if, the, if the namespace selector doesn't exist, but the, uh, the object label does, then that's, a, that's okay. We're also going to ignore in that case. So all those critical components that we run in the clusters, we make sure they actually have all the things that are necessary and that the mutating mission webhooks don't, aren't going to have to operate on them. So that, that's, that's, the, uh, that, that's the configuration. Um, real quick, I'd, I'd like to show um, the deployment itself that, that we're running here. This also is, is it's a very simple um, webhook. Um, it, it's a very, very simple container. Have a CNL webhook uh, container that's, that's hosted in the, uh, the DOCR registry. We're, we're exposing port 443 um, and I've mounted in a certificate. And in this case, I just use a self signed certificate. There's obviously, if you're going to do this in production, you'd want to do something probably more robust than that. And so this this runs in uh, the coordinating space, and I also um, have uh, this um, this deployment has um, the uh, uh, ever, all the pods has that label we talked about before to allow it to be ignored, so that if the webhook isn't running, that's the webhook pods can still be created. Yeah. So. Um I, I mean, w people are now exposed to the concept of uh, validating webhook, mutating webhook, and you've shown a few examples for how you are using it, uh, I guess, with uh, DigitalOcean. Is this like, do you have any uh, recommendations for, or ideas more, what people uh, could or should uh, um, Look after with those tools. Like what? What, uh, what possibilities? Uh, what are the possibilities for people to enforce or to change? Yeah. So if you're doing mutating emission webhook, um, you know one of the, like some of the things that we do in DOCC, they're they're very useful. Is hooking up the syslog socket for people. Um, we and we because we have a most of our services. Um, in order to get logging to central, centralized logging uh, are, are going to be using syslog. Um, and so we go ahead and hook that syslog up into all the pods for people automatically. We also do things um, like uh, inject environment variables to let people know what, which let applications know which cluster they're running in, which region they're in, what their service domain namespace is, um, or sorry, what their ser service domain is. Um, and and the, the cluster the cluster name itself and that all feeds into centralized logging so we can identify um, where something actually is and, and you know we, we have 14 large clusters uh, if you have your application deployed into five of those seeing errors in the logs you need to know exactly which one is coming from um, so, so we, we inject all of that um, we also do things like in, inject the uh, the root CA um, certificate so that um, we can establish trust um, with all the other services that, that are running in, in, the, in the clusters so, so that people don't have to worry about including all those things in their containers or, or in their applications that just gets hooked up automatically for them. Yeah, it makes complete sense, uh, actually. And it's uh, also maybe um, stressing a, a, a well-known um, debate or idea of the separation between uh, the developer's role and the operation people role when it comes to Kubernetes, which is kind of in the middle. So the developer, you know, is mostly concerned with writing their code and making sure the application is functional. Uh, where does the line go? Like, do, do we ask them to also uh, know about Kubernetes primitives to deploy their app? And if they do, um, how far should their uh, knowledge or familiarity with the platform go? And in this um, couple of examples that you just shared, uh, I think we see a nice idea of uh, letting 
the developer deploy um, their applications using Kubernetes primitive, but kind of uh, a simplified version of it where you say, don't worry about it. I will fix up whatever uh, I need, meaning the operation people, uh, in order for that to work in the bigger uh, context. That's right. Yeah, this this is all about making sure or, or trying trying to make sure is that that um, application developers can focus on delivering that business value, and they don't have to worry about all those operations and the particulars about how to how to configure their applications or operate their applications in these large multi tenant environments. And you know, especially as as it, as uh, organization grows and gets more complicated, you want people to be be able to specialize, and you want application developers to be able to focus on developing code and delivering business value and operations folks to be able to just focus on operations and these mutating emission webhooks uh, can help bridge that gap um, and to reduce that tribal knowledge. It also frees up operations and, and administrators to make changes to how the clusters are configured, right? If, 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 I, if we decide, you know what, we, for whatever reason, we want to put the syslog socket into a different place or we want to start into, into introducing new environment variables um, to, to explain or to, to allow applications to, to understand more context of where they are or what else might be near them, then mutating emission webhooks can, can help with that. And you can just introduce new mutating emission webhooks and let people know, know hey, when you redeploy, you're gonna have these these new things. Yep. So if, if, if it's okay, I'd like to start going into exactly how we build one of these mutating emission webhooks and start going to controller runtime. Um, yes. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start out very simply, we're going to start at a high level and go through um, the, the main, you know, just the, the, the high level of, of how, how this works. Um, and hopefully by the end, we'll be able to talk about testing a little bit um, because Controller Runtime has some great testing features. Um, we'll back up just, just, just for a minute. Um, Kubernetes, uh, if, you, if you've written Kubernetes code, you know, you're probably familiar with, with controllers. Um, controllers are going to work with informers or, or watch or watchers. Um, controller runtime takes informers and, and uh, watchers and and the, those concepts and, and reconciliation concepts and abstracts a little bit further, so they're even easier to work with. Um, controller runtime also provides the, the framework for for working with webhooks more easily. So, you know, Kubernetes itself doesn't prescribe what. Uh, a webhook has to be implemented in. It just says it needs to be HTTPS. You could implement your uh, webhooks in Ruby if you want to. You can you can implement your webhooks in in Go or Rust or whatever feels most comfortable to you. Uh, but controller runtime is is targeted Go and makes it very easy to, to start creating webhooks. So what we have here is we have a very simple um, application that is is our webhook server, and the main function just calls real main so we can get back an error. Um, it's a common pattern. It's just, it does really three simple things. It creates a cre creates the configuration, um, passes that configuration off to the controller. In this case, controller is not like a reconciler. It's just um, uh, it, it's just a, it's a controller in the sense that it's going to run. It's going to it's going to have some lifetime. You can think of this as anything that's runnable. Um, this this code is borrowed from. Um, some of the things we have at, at DigitalOcean that I've pared, pared down a lot. So this is kind of set up to, so you can build out from it and, and start making it much more complicated, introducing more more, more than this, the, this one webhook. You start introducing reconcilers and things like that if you wanted to start dealing with um, reconciling resources in your, in your cluster. So, so after we get the config, uh, we create the controller, and we want to we want to hook up uh, context handling so that when when the when the pod needs to be terminated by uh, Kubernetes, it will handle the termination signal and, and shut the controller down quickly, um, so it doesn't have to be killed. Um, and then and then we run the controller. So all all pretty all pretty straightforward. Um, I'm going to go over here into new new config because it has some it sets up flags and some things that we don't need to worry about too much today. But one of the important things that it does here um, is it has to create a, a, a manager. And this is this is one of the key things in, uh, in controller runtime, is this concept of a manager. A manager uh, provides the, the scheme, um, a cert directory, a port, a number of other options that, that you can add. Um, if, you're, if you're gonna be dealing with uh, resources, so if you're doing something this, uh, that is mutating a custom resource, or even some core resources, you, you need to add the scheme. Um, to to your options, and you do that by just doing runtime.newScheme, 
adding that to Kube scheme uh, and, and passing passing everything off to to the manager. And that's a critical piece for uh, for a controller runtime manager. After after we create the config, then we need to go create the uh, the controller itself. Again, this is this is really straightforward, pretty simple. We have a, a, a base URL that we that we need to configure. We have a number of options that we got from new config, and we and and it cre creates the controller. Controller is just it's just uh, in this case it's just a thing that has a run method. You might remember from over here on main that when we're done uh, at hooking up the context, uh, we we call when we're done hooking up the signal handling, we call run on the controller. And this is this is where the meat of things happen. So we, we set the logger on controller runtime so that um, both our application and the the, uh, the controller runtime manager will be using the same log so everything will get to uh, the same log sync. So they're gonna we're then going to register some webhooks. We're gonna register the webhook configuration. Uh, and, and this might be controversial. I know that a lot of people like to work with, with straight YAML. Um, and so that mutating webhook configuration we saw earlier is actually being created in this case by our, our process. So I, I personally don't like to work with, um, I, I don't like to have my YAML separated far away from my code and I want it to be more dynamic. Um, so that if I deploy a new version of, um, of, of our controller that the mutating webhook configuration also gets updated so it's all they're, so they're, they're tightly coupled because they are tightly coupled um, that allows us to uh, move a little faster it, it, it gives us locality of reference um, and it makes it a little bit more testable as well so we create the we register the webhook configuration we'll go to that here in just just a minute um, we have a have a set of handlers and these handlers in this case is just gonna be a, a bunch of a bunch of runnables um, in this case, one of them is going to be the manager. Um, we run all those in a go routine and wait for wait for them to return, and uh, and then once we're done, we return back out of our run function, the, the main exits, and the pod is done. So, so I just want to uh, clarify what you said um, like a moment ago about uh, the YAML being um, coupled with the code. Does that mean that when it when I want to deploy this uh, admission webhook, instead of uh, deploying the pod and registering it, I would just deploy the pod and it would register itself. That's exactly right. Yeah. So um, you you certainly could um, have your manage your YAML separately um, from from the code that you're deploying, but then the problem, of course, is that then you need to go deploy your code, and then you have to go up. You know, you deploy your your app, your update, and then you have to go update the YAML, or you, and, and so there's this time period where something, uh, there could be a, a penis mismatch between what's actually running and what the configuration is. And of course, if you do the opposite order, you have the, you have the exact same problem. So yeah. by putting it into the code, we can be assured that like when when we start running, we update the configuration right away and, and immediately the handler kicks off. Great, thanks for the explanation. Yeah. Um, so again, in run, we're gonna register the webhooks. And what we're doing here is we're gonna be registering them with the manager. We're going to register the webhook configuration. Um, we're going to be, for that. We're actually going to register it with uh, uh, the Kubernetes control plane. Uh, we register the handlers, and so let's let's dig into what registering reg registering the webhooks actually looks like. Um, so this is again is a pr pretty simple method. Um, we have a uh, we get the URL for our for our for this one particular um, webhook. Remember our. Uh, mutating webhook configuration can, can describe multiple hooks. Um, so in this case, we're just doing the go max prox um, webhook. Then we we, reg we register that with uh, with the hook server, which is oh, sorry about that. Uh, we register that with uh, with the manager. So we, we grab the webhook server from the manager, and that this is that controller runtime manager type. Register it. Now, all we do is we, we just give it a, a, an emission um, type, and the an emission um, is, is an interface that has a handler method, and that's kind of it. Um, and so, in this case, if we take a look at a register server, 
obviously it just takes an HTTP handler, which uh, if you're familiar with those, it has, it's a simple function that has a response and a request, an HTTP re response and HTTP request. So that's, that's all you pass off to register. Um, this admission type um, has, has a handler and it is a, a handler interface, which just has a single handle method. Um, and in this case, uh, we are going to create a, uh, a mutate pod strategy handler. So remember, this is really part of a larger piece of code. So um, you wouldn't have to have a strategy. You could just have a single handler that will take care of what the strategy does here. But we'll take a look at the strategy. You can see, again, it's really pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, we hook up a logger and a, uh, and a mutate function. In this case, the mutate function is going to be modifying our, our Gomax procs. Um, in the handle method, there's a couple of things you need to do. You need to decode your pod, because that comes in on, on the webhook admission request. And then in our case, we're going to, we're going to mutate it. We'll be modifying the, uh, the pod in some way, potentially. Then we marshal the result of that process and then provide a patch response. So when we, what, what, what this does is this tells the control plane, hey, you gave me this raw thing originally, and, which is JSON. Uh, I'm going to give you a JSON response back to that. And what the control plane will do is look at those the, the differences between those two things. Um, and and, and, well, actually, sorry, back up. Pat, the patch response from raw gives compares uh, the raw and the marshal, figures out exactly how to create, construct a patch that Kubernetes understands, and passes that back in the response for Kubernetes to mutate the pod itself. So, so we're not these these webhooks don't don't mutate the pods themselves. It tells Kubernetes how to mutate it. And then once once we've done. Once we've done that, we now have our webhook is registered, and it's time to it's time to can update the, the uh, configuration. Before we go on the configuration, you have any questions about how those handlers work? Do we want to get into looking looking at the actual handler for the GoMax Prox now, or should we keep going to uh, the configuration first? I don't see any questions uh, coming up on chat. Um... So yeah, we can continue. Just a quick clarification. Actually, a question of mine. Uh, so yeah. we uh, in the previous step, we uh, got the raw uh, object into the webhook handler. Uh, we did something and we returned uh, a patch. Does the patch go through the same pipeline and again through the admission uh, webhook, or is there some kind of exception there? Uh I'm not sure I understand understand the question. So, if the, uh, the if the result of this operation is a a, a patch, meaning please Kubernetes do something, that is another like a, a, an operation against Kubernetes API, and the webhook is validating or muting that request as well or not? Yeah. So, so if if. If, if I, mean, I, th I think your question is like, if, if we if we if we modify the pod in some way, we mutate it, does it then get sent back through again because it, because it's being modified? Yeah, I mean the actual uh, request to modify. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're, we're we're creating a pod in this case. So it's actually part of the, the mutating webhook configuration about whether or not you you can call multiple times or not. So you you can you can either say yes, call me at least you can call me up to one more time. Or don't call me again. Um, and so, if you have a, if like one of your webhooks needs might need to respond to changes that other webhooks might do, then you want to make sure that you, you can call this webhook multiple times for a single creation event. Um, if, if, but if you're, if you don't care, if you just need to do your thing and, and, and move on, then you can say, yeah, don't don't call me again. And that's the, that's part of the the, um, the webhook configuration. Great, thanks. Yeah. That's a good question. Okay, so after we create the create and register the, the, the webhook um, with the manager, then we, we want to go ahead and register these webhook configurations with the control plane. Um, in this case, again, we're going to need that webhook base URL because we have to put that into the mutating webhook configuration. 
So in this case, what we've done is we've created a, 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 uh, a set of webhook configurations. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, give me all, all the mission webhook configurations. And we have a, a set of these. Let's see if I can find them under there. Yeah, so it's just, it's just a, a string of them um, or a slice of strings of them for the ones that we can pick, want to configure. And then we say, okay, give me, give me this, the webhook config. And what we've done here is we've defined a type in our code that is really just the, the things that we care about on, on a webhook config, the things that are going to vary among our webhooks. And that's going to be the path. So or we have, we have, we're going to be running an HTTP server. We want to provide a path um, so we can deal with different, um, different webhooks being served by the same server. We're going to describe a failure policy because we might this might be ignore, it might be fail. We're going to have the re-invocation policy, which is what you were just asking about, um, which is you know how, how do we how do we deal with the, uh, this webhook if another webhook changes something on that as well? And you can look at this documentation um, that describes um, what this particular policy type means. So again, it can be called at least one additional time. In this case, because we have if needed reinvocation policy, and in this case, because we're we're because we're dealing with pods, we really don't care about create. I don't care if you if somebody is is trying to update a pod or something like that. Um, we're we're modifying the containers and, and the environment variables on it, so we don't need to worry about um, anything other than other than creates. Um, you do need to make sure you set the, the scope. Um, it's either. Uh, namespaced or, or unnamespaced scope because we're dealing with pods they are namespaced so we're going to go through that set of webhook configurations we'll grab the url for each of them so we can build it and that and so what we're doing here is we're grabbing the base url from our controller and just adding the, the path from the configuration we just looked at onto that and and make sure we resolve the reference up pro properly in order to set that on to its mutating webhook client config is here. We also go ahead and include that cert bundle for, for the server. We uh, apply the roles to the configuration, the policy, all those things that are uh, that, that we just talked about. Um, and this is our, our initial handler. Now remember we said we want to be able to make sure we respond appropriately if there are uh, if there are for, for, for critical things that need, that don't care about the webhook, that it's like it's okay if the webhook fails because we have those things fully configured. In those cases, usually what's happening is like the operators of the cluster are making sure that everything is is, is configured um, for those things correctly um, because these webhooks are primarily focused on making it easy for, for most users. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, if the failure policy um, on this uh, on this particular webhook is fail then we're going to add a add a couple of selectors uh, first one we're going to do, make sure the namespace that doesn't have the allow webhook failure label we're also going to make sure the object doesn't have um, the allow webhook failure and then we're going to add that to mut mutating webhooks we're also going to pass um, in this case we're going to get those additional um, webhooks based on this particular hook so we're going to create the normals from mutating webhook, and this is code that's in that's in the controller to make to make it easy. Um, do a couple of things. We're going to copy our original hook because when you deal with Kubernetes objects, when there's so many pointers involved that you want to do a deep copy that way you get a fresh full copy because you don't want to uh, modify sh shared objects or shared values on um, on these on these two nested structures. So in this case, we're going to say, hey, the failure policy is going to be ignore if the label uh, selector for the namespace doesn't exist. Sorry, if the label for the namespace doesn't exist, but it does exist on the object. And then we're going to do, some, do the same thing, but for the namespace, where we say, hey, if, if, the, lab, if the namespace has the, the allow web of failure label, then it can be ignored as well. And then we return all those those uh, webhooks um, from admission webhook configs. And then we just do a pretty straightforward absurd operation where we uh, yeah. 
All right, we're not we're not up a page and didn't mean to. Um, so we we check to see if the mutating web configuration already exists, and if it does not exist, then we want to create it. Otherwise, we want to update what was already there. Standard upsert operation. And then finally, we we'll, we might register some handlers and. This in this case is mostly just the, the runnables you'll see here in a minute um, with with when we get into some of these tests about how uh, this works with with other handlers if we if we're running more than just the the one server. Any questions before I before we go into the GoMax prox mutating function to see what see how it actually works? Uh, no, I don't think so. I'm monitoring the chat, so if something comes up, I'll let you know. Okay. So we're going to register webhooks and a new mutate go max proc. So it's again, so our, we have a a, a strategy, um, so we so we can um, reduce the boilerplate, and that strategy takes a mutate pod. Which is just a function that takes a context, a namespace string, or the name of a namespace, and, and a pod. Um, and so, in this case, our uh, our mutate pod function comes from this constructor, new mutate go max prox, um, and it passes passes back set go max prox. And so, this is the thing in our case that really is going to be doing the work um, of, of figuring out what the pod should look like. So, first thing we're going to do is we're going to go through all the containers. In the pod spec, remember we we already decoded this over in the strategy to reduce the boilerplate when we have multiple um, multiple pod uh, mutators. First thing we're going to say, hey, does it have a go max prox environment variable? If it does, then we don't want to do anything. We just want to continue because at that point we're assuming that the uh, that the, the 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 users have have intentionally configured go max prox, and we don't want to do it. We don't want to overwrite whatever they've done in that case. And assuming that they don't have GoMax proc set, we're going to grab the CPU, uh, make sure it's not zero, um, and then, and then we're we're going to see if, uh, if 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 it's less than uh, the minimum CPU. If it is, and we'll set the CPU limit to the minimum CPU, and then we're going to set an environment variable for um, for, for GoMax procs, um, and that GoMax proc is always going to be a whole integer value, so we do some integer division here. Um, we so we set max prox on the go max prox environment variable, add that to the environment the uh, env slice, and then add set the container back um, so it has that new environment variable. One thing um, I feel like I should point out here is that at the top of this uh, this function, it does talk about. Uh, let's see, I think it's in here. There is there, there are multiple maybe I don't have it in here but there are multiple ways you can set environment variables. Um, it, it could be could, could be uh, env or it could be like from env I think or env from in which case it could come from like a, a secret or something. Um, we don't mess with those in in this for this mutating emission webhook. Um, you certainly could if you if you wanted to cover all the cases but um, we're just trying to get you know 80 95 percent of, of the cases here uh, to help protect the health of the clusters. And that's what the uh, the GoMax Prox webhook itself looks like. And so at this point, um, we 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 have our controller, and uh, and we've run it. And now we are we are simply waiting for the whole thing to finish before the before the process ends. Um, and that's what this wait is for. We put out a nice message saying, "Hey, we're stopping the controller." So there's, there's a couple of other things we should talk about. Um, one is testing. Um, controller runtime has some really nice uh, test environments where you can you can create very holistic tests that will actually use a a uh, a, a, a subset of the control plane. It uses Kube API server and etcd. Um, it'll, so if you have those binaries locally, um, you can you can run your tests against that API server and that etcd. Um, so that you can actually make sure, like, hey, I'm, I'm expecting to modify this pod, right? So this this is getting beyond unit tests and getting into like testing the integration, right? We we want to trust Kube controller to do what it's supposed to do. We want to trust Kube to do what it's supposed to do, but we want to make sure the Kube API server 
uh, is is calling our webhook, and our webhook is delivering the proper response. Um, so uh, controller runtime provides an uh, uh, EMV test. I believe that's I believe that's the practice name. I always have to look it up. Um, see if I can find it real quick. Um, Yeah, it is. It is. It is named EMV test, um, and it, it, we'll, we'll take a look at the documentation here in just a minute. Um, but if you have those binaries locally, you can you can run your tests against them to make sure, like, yeah, hey, my pod after I create it, I actually go grab it and it actually looks the way I expect it to look. Um, and so we'll we'll take a look at those tests. But before we do that, um, I want to real quick show um, what this. Uh, what this would look like, uh, this one. Let me know when you can see the, uh, the browser. Just a sec, we need to head here. Do you, do you, do you see the, the uh, EMV test documentation? Yeah, now we do. Okay, great. So EMB test come, is, is pretty straightforward. Um, you can control things with the Kube Builder assets environment variable that, that just specifies a, a location on your on your machine where it, where you can find a Kube API server and an etcd. Um, you do not have to be running on Linux to do this. So although Kubernetes really only publishes the uh, the Linux binaries, you can you can get the source code for Kubernetes. Go into the, the the root directory, the repository, and run make kube API server, and it'll build a kube API server for you on, on your system. So I'm on a I'm on a on a MacBook, and we'll see what that looks like here in just a minute to actually run these run these tests locally. Um, also, going to show exactly kind of what the what using some of these tests looks like and, and how to configure something. Back to the terminal window. There you go. You see it now? Yeah. Great. So first thing we'll do is we'll just do go test here. Um, and you're gonna see not much. You're gonna see you're gonna see test pass. Right now we're gonna say Type. So in this case, I have um, the, the test that used the, the uh, EMV test environment tagged with with a, a sandbox environment because they require something more than what someone might have on their on their machine, um, and so we separate those from standard unit tests. And so I provide the sandbox. Uh -huh tag to go test. While it's running, uh, there's a question in the chat. Um, what's the best way to conditionally set Go Max Crocs because it's only applicable for Go applications? So uh, you mentioned that you are a Go shop, so maybe you are not concerned with it, but do you have a general recommendation for people? Yeah, you know, so I, I, I for go, so the, the specific question, I, I, I think the the right answer is just set go max blocks. Just as if if you if you have a lot of go code, just go ahead and set it. It's not it's not going to hurt other other things. Um, yeah. The the general question of, of how you would control that, um, if you if there were some other kind of environment variable that um, you might want to set for say for whatever reason for like a Java app application but not for a .NET application, um, in that case. I would you would probably have to go with an annotation, um, and the the value there too though is that you can you can using annotations and, and providing a, a set of annotations for your users that you support, you abstract away the details of what might happen. So you might say, hey, in in our particular environment, um, we know that we're going to want to do certain things. Uh, those those things might be like, oh yeah, I need to hook up logging. So one of the things that we do at DigitalOcean. You know, we talked about getting the logs to centralized logging. I talked about syslog. 
but we actually have more than one way to, to get logs to centralized logging. We can we can um, have the application write directly to syslog, but we can also read it directly from um, standard error and standard out and, and using fluent bit and getting those things to, to syslog. So in that case, we provide uh, to provide an annotation, or two annotations actually, um, that allow people to do, kind of opt in to the syslog experience or to just to do the standard out logging to get their their logs to stand, to um, to to centralized logging. And so when you're building a platform, you want to provide something that you can support. Um, and so if you had some kind of environment that you people need to be able to set, maybe it's not actually the environment they need to set. They want them to be able to set an annotation. And then your your uh, webhook can look at that annotation and take appropriate action. That might be setting environment variable. It might be something else, right? You might have something that says, hey, I, I want all I want all of our, our folks to um, annotate their pods with or with with kind of what kinds of things are running in this, like how how they're being run, um, because you might want to hook up JVM environment variables or something like that. Great, thank you. Yeah. So so here you can see we, we got a lot more uh, a lot a lot more tests that came out of this, or a lot more a lot more logs that came out of this, and the reason is because it spun up the uh, the um, API server and etcd. I'm going I'm to run this in verbose mode so you can really see all the logs because um, I'll show you in just a minute. Um, the the tests are configured so that when we run tests in verbose mode, we also hook up the uh, the API server and etcd logs to standard standard out so we can see everything that outputs, which is really useful whenever you're having a problem. Like you know, it, uh, maybe, maybe your your server is crashing, your control isn't working, or um, it's not trusting the certificate, and so your tests are failing because but you can't see why because it's really Kube API server is getting a, a response it can't handle. So here we have a whole lot more logs, and these all come from etcd and from from Kube API server. Let's go. Let's go take a look. Let's go take a look at those those tests real quick. So in this case, we have a, a simple uh, test function: test go match prox. And what we do here is we we create a pod. Notice it doesn't have uh, uh, the the go max proc set, um, and but we do make sure it has a CPU limit. And then when we're when we're when we're done, uh, we make sure that hey our uh, our env um, variable or environment variable for the container has has a go max proc set. Um, and the value is what we want it to be. Obviously, this could be you can handle all of your other edge cases. You can make sure, like, yeah, if I if I have go max proc set that it doesn't override it, you can make sure that when you're dealing with parts of CPUs that it's, it does the right thing. In this case, I just want to do something simple to show. Yeah, like we can we can actually test this. Um, and the way this works is I've created this function with test env. Uh, tags. We have with with test env, which creates a new TS, test env and then executes the the uh, um, function that we pass in here to actually do the test. That, this new test env is a thing that actually sets up um, Kube API server um, and you know the control plane that we need for 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 these tests. It's pretty straightforward. Again, you can create an env test environment. This again, this comes from controller runtime. You grab the API server. We make sure we configure it. You can pass pretty much any, you can configure all the API server flags that you want um, through this method. You uh, configure returns back a, uh, a set of process arguments that have an append method um, that you can, so you can add additional arguments to API server. And then you start it. Um, what you get back is a REST config that is, um, if, you're, if you're not familiar with these, um, this is a, a type in, in uh, I, believe, I believe it's in, I think it's in client go. Um, yeah, it's in client go. It contains the host API path, um, the credentials you might need, um, as well as a TLS, con TLS config. So um, that allows you to connect to um, the, uh, the, the API server that, that, that it's stood up. And again, this API server is working locally. You, you can connect to, uh, to a real cluster if you want to, um, but you mostly don't need to because, because all you really want to do in these cases usually is test like, hey, the pod has the right form, and then then we're going to trust Kubernetes to do the right thing with it. And and then we pass that REST config off to our new config function that we saw 
earlier that configures um, uh, the manager and everything. And so I really encourage people to, 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 to use uh, test EMV. Uh, you don't have to use that. You don't even have to be using controller runtime. If you're writing code in, um, uh, uh, in you're not using controller runtime for whatever reason, you're using watchers and informers, you can still use controller's runtime test EMV to really write very robust tests. It's a good, good tip. Thanks. thanks. Uh, and also, thanks for the uh, crash course here on uh, controller runtime, webhook, admission controllers. I think that uh, it was very educative, even people who might have been familiar with the concept, uh, looking at the code and looking at the uh, actually a, a real world use case uh, sharing from your experience. So thank you for that. Um, we do have like a couple of more minutes if someone wants to ask uh, some questions uh, over the chat. If not, you could use the Slack channel that we have, uh, which is um, cloud-native-live on the CNCF workspace on Slack. So feel free to ask. Uh, further questions there. I don't see any uh, other questions. So I think we could uh, uh, wrap it up. Um, any uh, last uh, words, uh, summary, Billy? Yeah, so um, a couple of things. You know, I, I just kind of re want to reemphasize that um, mutating web emission webhooks and, and validating emission webhooks are really the foundation upon which you can start to build a platform on top of Kubernetes for your users and, and start to get rid of some of that tribal knowledge and, and allow your, your administrators and operators to be more flexible in, in how they deal with everything, um, how they how they provide a, a, a consistent experience to their users. Um, thanks for having me. This, this was a lot of fun. I, uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out. All right, thank you. And uh, just a reminder, this is Cloud Native Live. We're here uh, every Wednesday. So uh, tune in next time. And uh, thank you, Billy. And uh, see you next time, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye.